This is The Way We Were, the series that offers a unique glimpse into the past using newly discovered archive footage never seen before on British television. So let's travel back to a golden age when life seemed much simpler and no matter what, you always respected your elders. The head of the household was my dad. He absolutely ruled with an iron rod. He was a sergeant major in the war, and that's how he was. He was very upright, and what he said absolutely went. I was the, and I am the third of um, three daughters, so I think my two sisters probably got any strictness that, that was going. My parents had kind of given up by the time they got to me. But they were very nurturing. Uh, home life was terrifically important. Life really revolved around the five of us in the family. Every now and again, he would, he would threaten his belt. If I played up, he would go to take his belt off and as if he was going to hit me with the belt. He never did, fortunately, but it was the threat was enough for me not to do whatever I was doing again. I was very lucky because uh, my mother, she was, a, a, in inverted commas, a housewife. You know, she didn't go out to work, but when I came back from school, uh, my mother was there, and I think that's very important, and probably it's something that children nowadays, or a lot of children nowadays, don't experience. While Dad worked nine till five, Mum had a full-time job too, at home. My mother did all the cooking, the housework, the shopping and the washing. And my father, he, he worked five and a half days a week. And when he came home, his slippers were warming by the open fire. And uh, my mother placed his dinner on the table. There was an oddity in my family in, in that the women were stronger than the men. My mother was as tough as old boots, my grandmother was equally strong. She was from Lancashire. Um, and the men tended to be a little scared, I think, of the women. Um, yes, the women cooked, but they also did the accounts, and very often they did the breeding patterns for the cattle. And the men tended to stay on the land and keep away from the house as much as they could. <laughs> My father was very beautiful. He had bright blue eyes. He just enjoyed life. He, he had a tremendous enjoyment of life. So, although it was a traditional family with my father going to work, my mother at home, it wasn't that traditional in that my father retired quite early. And even though he was a businessman, he um, was quite a well-off businessman. It wasn't a sort of poor house. It wasn't rich either, but we were comfortable. In the days of post-war rationing, life was all about making ends meet and making do. Back then, a couple of eggs was a feast. And a neighborly smile didn't cost a brass farthing. We had always a very interesting life. You know, if Mother said at one time, you know, I think Eva should have a separate room because she's growing up, my brothers immediately went out, got two ton of breeze blocks, came in, and we had one of those front rooms which had a window and then a little bay window. Up they went with the breeze blocks. I had a bedroom by the evening, a separate bedroom. So I had a very enterprising, interesting parents, good, very good parents. My father would get up, he would go to work, he would come back, he would, you know, for lunch, and, and my mother would cook him uh, two meals a day. And he would come home and he would have his chair, it was his newspaper, and, and my father ran the house. He didn't run it with an iron fist, it wasn't unpleasant, it was just a, a, a mode of life. My mum was as soft as they came. She cooked a different meal for everybody if they chose, she made everybody's beds, she washed everybody's washing, and she was a right proper mum. She never ever worked other than in the home, which was constant work, of course. 
While Mum was weighed down by the shackles of domesticity, there was always one rather frightening family member to keep an eye on you. Aunties were important to us. The worst thing was you had to kiss the auntie, and they always wore tri tricorn hats, hats like three pointed things with great big netting all over them, which was stuck up under the chin. And you had to kiss these aunties, and you had to kiss all this netting, and they'd all got whiskers. I was born in Grantham, in Lincolnshire. My father was a doctor in a country practice there, and we had a, a big house. There was a staircase that went round. My father had his patients on the ground floor, and they would sit in the hall, and I and my brother and sister were very naughty. We, would, we could spit from the top right down to the bottom, and it was and make a splash when it hit the floor. Ugh, but I suppose being naughty kept your mind off the cold. Coal fires, you know, no central heating. We had a grate. Everything was cooked in the... In the you opened this oven and then we cooked all the potatoes. Everything was cooked. The Sunday dinner was cooked in there. But you had this lovely fire at the side. And when it was cold, we'd all sit round it because, and we all bathed in a tin bath. You know, we had the tin bath only once a week. We had two fires and, and my mum used to keep one fire burning through the night and then in the morning used to transfer the ashes from one fire to the other fire in the city room. And we had what's called a damper where you used to pull the damper down and that opened a cover on the boiler which meant that the fire heated the water and you had to wait for about half an hour before you got the hot water. So if you got up late for school, you know, forget having a bath or having a, a wash in warm water, you had to wait till that night or two days later or something, you know. So it was really, even though it was the 60s, which is not that long ago, it was pretty, it was pretty basic, really. When I was five, my parents bought the local boozer and we had something no one else had. We had hot water. We had this huge Ascot boiler that when you turned the tap on, it went <gasps> And I'm not joking, every time you turned that tap on, that pub must have lifted four inches off the ground. I wish I had a castle in the sky. Women longed for modern conveniences and labour-saving devices, and during the 50s, their wish came true. Adverts from across the pond showed the way. Oh, dear. Someday. With stars for windows, clouds for rugs, a rainbow for a door, I wish... I just wish I had a decent kitchen. We didn't have a washing machine when I was growing up. We just had this great big pot, uh, and it was always on the stove. We had a gas stove, and always it was boiling. And if it didn't have nappies in it, because I had a little brother, then it had hankies in it, hankies and knickers. She just boiled all the time, everything, and shirts, my dad's shirts she would boil. So there was always this fresh smell of, of, of clean washing in the kitchen. We had no telephone in the house. We got the telephone in about 1974 or 75. We had no colour television till 1975. And luckily, I was working in television. I was on television when I was seven years old, so I was earning a bit of money, not a lot, but enough to be able to buy things because we had nothing. You know, my mum wasn't working. She had to bring up the three of us. Uh, my sister moved out because she was older. She got married. My brother moved out, so it was just really me and my mum. And uh, what money we had came from kind of my television earnings, really. We didn't have a Modcon house. Um, we didn't have central heating and we didn't have uh, 
all of the latest gadgets. We had rented black and white TVs, but I do remember great excitement when we got our first fridge, our first telephone, which was a white dial-up telephone, and, uh, and all of these sorts of things, you know, the washing machine rather than the mangle. And I remember those all coming into the house, and, and they were treated as sort of objects to be venerated. We weren't allowed to press the buttons. I mean, you know, no, get away from that. In 60s Southampton, new high-rise buildings came with a downside. In our street, was a block of flats called Council Builders, and they were the first ever council flats built in Southampton. They had no bathroom, and you literally stepped from the kitchen straight in the loo, and they were so small, you could sit on the loo and fry your breakfast at the same time. Rediscover Upstairs. Stanner, the Stairlift People. He woke up this morning and he was stone dead. Our Doc Martin. He don't go in for pleasantries much. It's only a matter of time before your son's head explodes. What? Back to school, I think. Cameron, you are in big trouble! And he still has problems dealing with dumb animals. Doc, I can't just shut up. Do as you're told. But we love him all the same. The question is, can he learn to love us? Martin Clunes in the second series of Doc Martin, tonight at 10.05 on ATV3. We all have a place. A place where memories survive. A picture postcard that lives and breathes. It's just breathtaking. Where we are defines our being. I love this view first as a boy. What we see shapes our view. Every 10 miles you travel in Britain, the world changes. A five-part series looks at places that touch the soul. It's so dramatic. It's a fantastic view. Britain's favourite view. Coming soon to ITV1. Rediscover upstairs. Stanner, the stairlift people. Nineteen thirteen Southampton Hospital. This newly discovered archive footage reveals the harsh realities of hospital care and primitive procedures long before the NHS. Life on the ward was regimented and matron ruled with an iron rod. Working as a nurse could damage your health. First of all, you had to be on duty by 6.30. I mean, we got up in the dark at five and we had to walk three miles through Watford when I was at Leavesden. You had to be on duty half past six to seven, then you did a 12-hour stint. Every day, you see, you had to have the bed made, the proper corners, and, uh, the, and you had to have your patient washed before a certain time, and you'd have to have the bedpan run, which was the great thing. And you'd have poor patients say, nurse, nurse, they had to take my bedpan away. These scenes of hospital life were recreated for the drama series District Nurse, starring actress Neris Hughes. When I was playing Megan in District Nurse in the 20s and 30s, I think probably what I remember quite vividly in the hospitals was that you had to be pretty stoic. There were some treatments that were quite not harsh, but to our tender eyes, we have all these painkillers and anaesthetics and that, people had to be quite stoic. There, there was um, a regimented feel in the hospital. In those days, it was quite the done thing to whip out your tonsils and adenoids, whether they were infected or not. You got everything whipped out. Uh, it's a wonder I've got any, man any manhood left. Um, but so uh, they, they just did this, and uh, I can remember this awful hospital uh, uh, that I got sent to for a week. And in those days, of course, you were allowed very strict visiting hours. I think there was one hour between sort of two and three in the afternoon, and for the rest of the time, as a lad of about six, not knowing what was going on, uh, it was pretty awesome, really, just to be stuck there. I can just sort of vaguely remember the wards as being huge with rows and rows of beds and loads of kids in them, but presumably they were doing this sort of tonsil removal with mass production.
before modern antibiotics, the dreaded initials TB, short for tuberculosis, were like pronouncing a death sentence. Everybody got tuberculosis in, uh, when I was young. I think, I think that must have been in the Second World War, they all got tuberculosis. Because everyone was in chest, so they all went to the Bronson Chest Hospital. And from there, some of them were shipped off to Switzerland to have treatment. But they did have su sunray treatment, they had light treatment. They use the sterilizing effect of ultraviolet radiation to treat tuberculosis and rickets. It was effective and led to the development of sanatoriums abroad where those who could afford it would recover in fresh air and sunshine. But TB wasn't the only health scourge of the time. I remember a very strong feeling of seeing lots of children in wheelchairs paralyzed, an enormous amount of them, and it was polio. And you'd see children right up to the neck paralyzed. And the very common sight in my childhood, we've eradicated polio nearly now, but that was a very strong impression that I remember. This poor child is being treated for TB. She's about to be fitted with a plaster of Paris jacket to control all her spinal movement. It's laborious and terrifying. In the late 50s, a simple vaccination, a few drops on a sugar lump, all but wiped out infantile paralysis. Thank heavens. I remember going to hospital as a kid. I particularly remember one afternoon going to the eye hospital. Hospitals in those days were far... They're not friendly now, I don't think, really, but, I mean, they were far less friendly. They seemed very military to me. The colours, the sort of hideous green paint, I don't know what colour that was, green and cream, the metal frame beds, the smell when you went in there, the metal chairs and, and polished floors. Um, whether it was more hygienic, I don't know, but it was pretty austere. It was a quite intimidating place to be um, in, in those old-fashioned Victorian hospitals. And, uh, yeah, going there was clearly never going to be a pleasure. It was always a great incentive not to injure yourself badly. Well, healthcare, as far as I was concerned, growing up as a teenager, was just absolutely fantastic. My father was a doctor, so, I, so he was always there, you know, he was always there for me. You know, if I had anything wrong, then immediately a prescription, uh, he'd examine me. I mean, I had the best health care any child could uh, wish for. You know, when my father uh, passed away, that was the, that was the problem, because I, I, I had to go to an, a doctor, and I thought, oh, God, you know, get, a, get an appointment to see a doctor. And nowadays, of course, you know, once you get an appointment to see a doctor, um, you know, by the time you get the appointment, everything's all right again. You know, three weeks, you've got to predict now when you're going to be unwell. There was always one great tradition of British life that could banish the blues and make you feel so much better, whatever was ailing you. Yes, the great British cuppa. I was very lucky. I had tea with one of the Twinings. And he said to me, Genevieve, would you like to pour? So I poured the milk in first, then poured the tea. And he said, you know, you straight away show me your working class. Well, I looked. He said, years ago, upstairs had good quality china. You poured the hot tea in first. Downstairs, the working class. Poor quality china. You had to pour the milk in first. Then you poured in the hot tea. So in my house, we always have the tea in first. And what was it he said? Pot to the kettle, not kettle to the pot. When we had afternoon tea, when I was allowed in to the lounge for afternoon tea, it was vital, there was a ritual attached to it. We had a, one of those um, flop-down tabley things with shelves on it. And there was a strict pecking order for where the scones went, the cakes went, and the sandwiches went. 
and the tea. I mean, it was a sacred ritual. The tea was made and then poured, and then the milk went in finally. And that would always be Guernsey milk because we knew that was best. Everyone who came to the house was offered a cup of tea. It, the window cleaner would have a, be offered a cup of tea. The baker had delivered the bread. The milkman, if it was that time when he was being paid, you know, it was a social thing to do. It was a gesture, um, and of course, you invited people into the house to drink tea. My mother was always making proper tea um, with your teapot and your, you know, your china out, and she always had a, a sponge cake there, some biscuits. Um, so it was something that, I mean, it's not part of my life at all now, but was routine then. Tea was an institution, and I'm sure that, the, that my family's sort of life revolved around the making of tea. In fact, if we went out for the day on our bikes or walking, on the way home, somebody was always sent ahead to put the kettle on, so that when the rest of us arrived, we could walk in to a fresh supply. Definitely tea in our house was, and still is, a major thing. Tea and cake. We had tea with every meal. It wasn't coffee. It was tea with your breakfast, a cup of tea at lunchtime, and tea with your tea. You know, I would come home from school and I would have jam and bread and, and a big mug of tea, never a cup of tea, never tiny cups. Sometimes if my grandma came round, we'd have cups. But usually a big mug of tea. And to this day, I mean, I can't have fish and chips without having a mug of tea. I can remember going out with my grandmother many a time in Blackpool um, and having afternoon tea where you go into the vast emporiums which have, or emporia to be correct, that, have, that serve afternoon tea. Waitresses in black dresses with white aprons and little white frilly, frilly hats and they come and take your order and you have tea and you have toasted tea cakes and after rationing in you might even be lucky and have a meringue, you know, wow, fantastic! <laughs> Nothing quite beats a cup of tea. It wins wars, overcomes disasters. It's the glue in British society. That's one thing that hasn't changed. My mum always made a cup of tea, especially if there was, um, if you were upset about anything, then you would have a cup of tea. And I still do that now. I brought a box of tea bags back for my mum as a special treat. Yeah, mum, tea bags. And she went, oh, lovely. So she made the tea. And I was drinking it and I thought, this is funny, it's got bits in it. So I went, Mum, didn't those tea bags work? And she went, yeah, they was marvellous. And I said, I've got all tea in my cup. And she said, yeah. And I said, but how come? You know, it's supposed to stay in the bag. And she went, stay in the bag? She said, I thought it meant you didn't have to use a teaspoon. She'd cut each bag open and tipped the tea into the pot. 